You know, he saw this pain around him. He saw this hurt around him. He saw that the people had no hope at that place in their life. And he's like, man, he started to weep. He started to cry. He started to fast. He was like, this can't be, Lord. Let it, let it not be. This can't be a disgrace to your name or to your people. Your people are hurting, Lord. Use me. Would you use me? Would you, would you put people around me that we could rebuild this city? And in so doing, would we rebuild the lives of those who are hurting? And I think there's a Nehemiah call on the people of Journey Church that he's saying, would you do this? Would you see the lost and the hurting around us? And would we be a people who would get out there and get outside of our doors and go around people who don't look like us, who don't smell like us, who don't act like us, and say, I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to love on you because I want to see you come into the kingdom. There's so many people with broken hearts and broken lives. They have no hope. The answer is found in Jesus. The only way to remain unbroken is to have a life in him. And Nehemiah saw it. And when he saw that need, he responded. Might we at Journey Church be a people who would see needs and respond to them that lives could be touched and changed. Some of you might be here today and you feel broken down. You feel like you can't go on. You might even have a hardness of heart in your lives. But I want to tell you, you're here. You made it to Journey Church this morning. You made it to God's presence this morning. You're not dead yet in Jesus' name. He's not done with you yet. He will help you through those difficult life circumstances. I'm speaking to you who raised your hand and said, I'm going through the middle of it. Now I'm going to turn to those who raised their hand and said, you're not going through it right now. Thank you, Jesus, that not all of us are going through it right now. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Thank you to those who are not going through it right now. If you're not going through it, God wants you to be that Nehemiah. He wants to use you to touch somebody else's life. He didn't take you through your difficult circumstances so that you could be quiet about it. If he took you through those difficult circumstances and you've gotten to the other side, now's our opportunity to go back and lend a helping hand to make a difference in somebody else's life that they could experience the hope, the joy that comes from you. He will put people in your life that are going to approach you and are going to be like, how did you get through it? And I'm here to tell you, do not be silent. Do not be silent. Let him speak through you to touch and change lives and restore people to build back walls of health and hope and peace in their lives. Amen? Let us be people who bring joy. The next set of lyrics from the song I do take a little bit of difference with. Um, there's been times that we've read songs that, man, yeah, we could apply that in our life. And there's other times where I think that, hey, this isn't the best way. There might be a better way to deal with the difficult circumstances in life. It says, but I'm not home. I'm not lost. Still holding on to what I got. Ain't much left, though there's so much that's been stolen. Guess I've lost everything I've had, but I'm not dead, at least not yet. Still alone, still alive, still unbroken. I'm still alone, still alive, I'm still unbroken. Okay, here's the problem that I have with the song. They use the word ain't, and that ain't in the dictionary, so no. No, we'll see about that alone part. I don't think that God really intended for us to do it alone. Let's talk about reality for a moment, the lack of relationship with Christ. The verse started out and it says, I'm not home. It's true for every believer. It's true for every human being. The Bible says that he has placed eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes, it it talks about it. We'll read the scripture in just a second. But there's this sense in our lives that something's not right because we weren't intended for this place. So there's always this sense of irritability, this sense of discontent, this sense for longing for something more because we were created for a heavenly dwelling. We were never intended to live in this fallen earth that we find ourselves in. So God has this different plan and this different place for us. Go ahead and and project that next scripture, if you will. I think it's Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says, he has, so, he has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Um, I find, when I look at the stars in the sky, we sang about that earlier, the moon in the sky, the stars, they declare the glory of the Lord. You know, I'm fascinated by that. I don't get it. You know, when you, they had an article in the paper yesterday where they were talking about Venus is at its closest point to Earth in like 50 years. So Venus is there. You can see it in the night sky. It's always the brightest star in the sky. But yesterday, I guess it was 
ultra brilliant to be out there. And that just blows me away because they said it's like millions and millions of miles away, yet we could see it with our naked eye. Um, being the tech geek that I am, the other night we were all out at the Oakleaf um, football game. We were serving out there in the booth, and this guy, George, who's you know one of the volunteers who was out there, he says, Eric, man, I got something to show you. This is going to trip you out. And I was like, okay, cool. So he whips out this Google phone that he has. How many of you have heard of Google Earth? Do you know what Google Earth is? You can go like look at your house from the top. It gives you driving directions, things of that nature. He had this thing on his phone. It was called Google Stars, man. I mean, it was, it was crazy because whatever direction you held it in when you looked at the sky, it would tell you what stars were. There's, a, there's Venus, there's Mars, there's this, there's that. I was like, whoo, child, come on now. I mean, it was really just mind-blowing to see. I mean, it was that's what I think about when I read a verse like that or we sing a song like we did earlier that you know the moon and the stars they declare the glory of God there's this sense of knowing that there's more out there that we are not alone that God has our back that he cares for us and and there's this majesty and splendor that's hard to understand that we can't even fathom the song said I'm not lost to those of you who might be here who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I take offense at the song. It couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible teaches us that we all are lost, that we all fall short of the glory of God. It says it in verses like Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. Romans 3, 23, for all. Say all. all. Say it better than that. Say all. all. Say that means me, right? We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The next verse says, still holding on to what I got, still holding on to what I've got. As a believer, that can get you into some serious, serious trouble. There's times in our life where it's important to hold on, to not give up. But there's other times in our life where there's things that you just need to give up. You need to surrender. You need to turn over to God. If you keep trying to hold on to them, they're actually keeping you from your relationship with Christ. You got to give up to move forward. You got to surrender to win. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can't remain unbroken. You can't remain uh, rebellious. And when I say unbroken in this sense, you can't stay that wild horse. You can't stay that wild stallion holding on to what you've got. There comes a place where you need to let God break you in that sense so that you can get through whole on the other side. You know, it's you know, that, that old song, you know, uh, that, that we learned as a nursery rhyme, you know, about the egg falling. The Humpty Dumpty, right? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? Because some of the things that you're dealing with, no earthly thing can put you back together, I'm here to tell you. It's only going to be by the glue of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God to touch your life, to transform you if you'll only surrender those moments to him today. It says, but I'm not dead, at least not yet. Ephesians 2.10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Who's you? All of us, right? It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. You see, the scary part for those of us who are in the midst of those sins, in the midst of those transgressions, is when we don't see it and we continue to do it, we, we continue to think it's okay to go on living in those ways. Guess what? Its end ends in one place. It ends in death. If you're a believer, if you're an unbeliever, if you're doing things that you're not supposed to be doing and you're going on unrepentant, you are in a bad place. You need to repent. You need to turn your life over to God. You need to let him work out your salvation in fear and trembling is what it says, right? God works it out in us and through us. So enough of the difficult stuff, enough of the bad stuff, enough of the sorrow stuff today. The next verse in Ephesians starts to talk about the good stuff. What happens when you do surrender? What happens when you do turn your life over to God? This is where the miracle happens, where the joy can start to come into your life. Ephesians 2.6. It says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God's not by works so that no one can boast. Amen. It says, I'm still alone, still alive, still unbroken. 
You know, we were never created to do life alone. We were created to do life in community with others. So this is the verse that I really take offense at in the song in a sense that, you know, if you try to do it alone, some of us have willpower where we can get through some of these things. But in the Bible, he uses the word one another 2,447 times. That tells me that he wants us to go at life with other people. He wants us to go at life with those around us who are believers in Jesus Christ. What happens is we tend to... um, want to rebel. We tend to want to stay that unbroken horse. We want to go buck wild. We want to go crazy and we don't want to have to answer for it in Jesus name, right? We want to go out there and continue to do those crazy things. But what ends up happening is you end up being no fun to be around. Who wants to be around somebody who's kicking you and biting you and being nasty to you and cussing at you all the time? Do you want to hang around those kinds of people? No, there comes that surrender moment that needs to happen where we get broken, where our lives begin to change, where Christ begins to transform us. Um, I'll pick on somebody because I love them, and we shared about you last night, so you can't run out the room either. Blass, I'll pick on Blass. Blass, like, why are you picking on me? Blass is a big man. Smiley, I need your help. Would you sit up here for a minute just between us? You know, um, you know, I know one of the best moments of Brian's life. You know, Brian and them were, were friends. They, they knew each other growing up, and by his own admission, Blast wasn't the nicest of guys. He got into all kinds of issues. He got into, you know, drugs and alcohol and things that were not that edifying, and his life was going in a wrong direction. You know, one day he walked through the rooms of Journey Church and he, he came up to the front and he surrendered his life to Christ. He was subsequently baptized. He, he was subsequently baptized in the Holy Spirit and God has been working in his life and transforming him. And, you know, a week or so ago, I believe if this is true, I heard something about you saying, man, Pastor Brian, I believe God's going to have me be your Spanish pastor one of these days in Jesus' name. So, you know, God will transform a life that, you know, is kind of wild, that is kind of crazy. Bring those to church who you think are the furthest from God because he'll change people like that and he'll set them with the same fire and the same energy that they would serve God with everything that they have within their hearts and they will be world changers. So thank you for letting me pick on you, Blast. We love you, man. <clears throat> but woe to those who want to continue living your life your way. If you want to go on living your life your way, you are going to be in a world of hurt. That's what the Bible tells us. Our challenge for you that's here today, man, I'm serious. If that's you, repent. It's time to live your life God's way. That is where real life happens, amen? And when we do, incredible things begin to happen. Ephesians 2, uh, 9 ended with, it says that salvation is a gift from God, not by work so that no one can boast. But then 10 says something very unique. So we started off with this place where he's talking about we're all dead in our sins, we're all dead in our transgressions, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The answer is surrendering our life to Jesus Christ. When we do, we're saved by grace, we're not saved by works, but then he says you're saved to do something. And here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Very interesting thought. He says you're not saved by works, but you're saved to do what? To do good works.